conference. I'm joined on the line by the former Dundalk manager, Vinnie Perth. Evening, Vinnie. How are you doing? How's things, Nick? Not too bad. We might get on in a little while to talking about a, an eventful few weeks for you personally. But let's talk Ireland first because there's few people who know Stephen Kenny better and his footballing philosophy better than you with the incredible success he had in Dundalk over half a decade. What are your thoughts on last night's performance in particular? Were you expecting more? Um, no, I think like most other people, we knew it was early days in terms of the, such a such a drastic change of, of way Ireland played, and it is drastic. I mean, to go from 35, 40 odd percent possession to, to 55, 60 percent in the two games is huge. So there's a change of mindset there for the players, and you've got to understand the manager, but not just the manager, there's a whole change in staff. Um, and, a, and a change in players as well. I mean, the squad uh, was com wasn't completely different, but there was a huge amount of change. And you just look the front three of Adele, Adam, Ida, and uh, Conley. So um, there was a, there was a big change in the group. So from from that point of view, I expected it to take time. I think most most football people did. I heard your show earlier on with Kenny Cunningham and, and Gary Breen and. As much as Gary has been uh, a Mick man for for a long time, to be fair, I thought that that was very balanced, and and they, you know, when you look at ex players, really understood that this was going to take some time. Um, so I think I think um, we we have a we have a mindset in Ireland of looking at the, the negatives, uh, or a certain amount of people do, but mm. I think there was a lot of positives in that performance, and Ireland uh, and and Stephen. We'll look to that as opposed to the negativity that, that has come a little bit around the performance. One of the things that Gary Breen did say was that we are always going to be judging that as much as Stephen Kenny is just in the job and there will be a certain amount of leeway, when he goes to Slovakia next month, again, people are going to be judging. So on yesterday's performance, there seemed to be a positive enough reaction to Thursday night in Bulgaria. There were quite clear signs that Ireland were trying to do something different, that albeit players looked a little bit uncomfortable with that. And on home soil, expected more of the same, that Ireland would get on the front foot, would start to dominate possession a little bit more, even with a brand new three-man midfield. That never really seemed to happen. They, they, they struggled to control the game in any real way. Why do you think that was? Um, well, I suppose credit to, to Finland for a decent side who qualified. The shape of that sort of 5-3-2, um, I just you just heard Duffy speaking about sometimes they were 2v2. Um, and there was a little bit of, I think Stephen has used the word experimental um, around Ireland. So there was a little bit of that. Um, the, they just had one day to prepare for that game between the, the two games and, and that's part and parcel of it so look, um, Slovakia is the start of Stephen being judged I would say, but there's plenty of time I mean um, yes, there's pressure on this is this is big boy football now so mm. what comes with that is is a little bit of pressure but um, I, think it's, I think it's very early in a manager's reign to sort of start uh, worrying too much. Um, our players are so out of match sharpness. When you look at the, I watched England against Iceland the other day, and very similar. E England were really, really poor, and so many of our players are in the same stage from a fitness point of view and a sharpness point of view as the English players. So, um, Finland last night were obviously fitter, fresher, um, and the players were, were by and large, most of the players are back playing. So. Uh, I think the biggest example of it is, is Shane Duffy. He's a real leader for Andy. Someone that Stephen made captain for the two game without Coleman, but he looked he looked just off it in, in sharpness. I think if you go back to the goal he conceded against Bulgaria, um, there was a lot of talk about the midfield or whatever. But Shane's recovery just wasn't there for that goal, and um, I think that would come. That would come with playing regularly for for Celtic, and and I think you'll get a different performance from him and the rest of the team next month. In terms of what he will be looking for and might have hoped to get a little bit more out of, Ireland pressed quite high up the pitch, which meant they ended up in a little bit exposed at times defensively. Is it a real high press that you expect Stephen Kenny to go with? Is he going to expect his front three to be right up on the centre halves, right up in the edge of the penalty area from goal kicks and, and the midfield up close behind as well? Or do you think at international level with the players he has that it may not quite be that, I won't say positive, but that he may not actually want to commit quite as many men forward as he did at times over the first two games. Again, it, it depends who you play against. So what happened yesterday was Finland 
at a back three and Ireland's back three sort of match them up as such, or for Ireland's front three. Mm. But I think against Bulgaria, you're seeing Connolly had a great chance from uh, Bulgaria's goal kick where he went and pressed, and they're not going to let uh, the opposition by and large have the, the ball from goal kicks. And we want we should want to see that. We should want to see a little bit of pressure. Um, yes, if they beat the press, then we've got to get into good recovery positions. And I think that will come, and, and you can't fix everything at once. But I think the the high press uh, is something that, from what I know, when we will look for, whether he does that with this bunch of players, I don't know. But I think he will. Uh, I think we've got real speed and, and power in, in the wide areas and, and up front if we need this. So I think it is a weapon that we should use to stop letting teams have, have the ball uh, at least comfortably from goal kicks and, and go from there. But I think um, the, the front three in the two games, ironically, such a young front three, 25, um, 21, 19, mm. weren't the issue with, with Ireland's performance in any way, shape or form. The, the front three done quite well, to be fair to them. What about the midfield then and, and what he looks for from a midfield? If it is a a three-man midfield. Is he looking for three players who will dominate possession, who will get 60-65%? Or is he looking for somebody that when you don't have the ball is pressing high, is pressing quickly, is winning the ball back, is full of energy and is letting Ireland go on the counter-attack? Which is the preference? Is, is it is it all-out dominance of the ball or actually letting the opposition have it from time to time? Um, listen, Stephen can be pragmatic when he needs to be. Remember, we went to places like AZ Alkmaar and let them have it at different stages or Zenit St. Petersburg or uh, Zenit um, in Petersburg, we let them have it as well at different stages and we counter-attacked them. So uh, he's a manager who knows how to work different systems. The problem we have in with, with midfield is like with Dundalk, he certainly preferred a number 10 and we don't really have a natural number 10 with Ireland. But uh, if you notice in the, in the last two games, he's played with two number eights. Mm. Um, and, that, and that changes. So people say it's 4 3 3 and 3 in midfield, but it can be a 2 and a 1. It can be 1 1 and 1. And there's low, listen, we could, you could get bogged down in different systems. But effectively, um, to play a 4 3 3, most managers, I would say, would prefer a number 6 being the, the McCarthy, what he was asked to do, or, or Arthur yesterday. They prefer an 8 who, who to explain, is a box to box type. And you prefer a, a number 10 like in the mould of a Wes Hulahan, that type of player, if you can get it. Um, so I, I would say that would be his preference, but I don't see us having a, a natural number 10 mm. in the squad at the moment. I don't see one really that good enough. Uh, we've got people who can play there. Hendrick can play there. Brady can play there. So they probably reverted to the to the two eights, and I think that uh, that needs a little bit of work, and that and that can um, the, the problem with that can be when the ball uh, turns over, Especially with our two wing, our two fullbacks being quite high, we are exposed at times, and that's something that he can fix, and and the, the staff can fix very easily. Um, so th there's a little bit of tinkering to be done with the shape in midfield, and once he gets his best midfield on the on the pitch, I think they can do that. Um, they can do that over time. Do you think that is an easy fix if? your central midfielder is a James McCarthy who's maybe not as mobile through injuries or just through his general style of play that like the way you're talking you, you would if you had a number 10 and I don't know maybe tries to transform a Jeff Hendrick or a Robbie Brady or somebody else into a number 10 and we saw he tried different things with the 21s in in that position you could tr play a Troy Powers maybe even Dave McGoldrick a little bit deeper that if you had a Malumbi or an Arter alongside McCarthy in, in the base of the midfield and somebody a bit more forward it might just give you a bit more protection in front of the defence. Yeah, well, I suppose that's the point. So Malumbi is, is a perfect example where he's the modern day number eight. We would have seen him for the 21s, but even at Millwall last year were just huge energy. And I thought uh, he looked he looked really good in terms of his energy levels the other night, but just the crispness and the, the sort of sharpness in his passing wasn't there yet, which is normal because it's pre-season for him. So he, he would be a good fix. The issue with, with him might be that he mightn't even get into the Brighton team over mm. the next month. So that's an issue. So and it, that's where it, it'd be very hard to predict the, the team at the moment because we've got so many players that are there or thereabouts to get into the team. But um, it, 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 is, it, it is an easy fix in the sense of um, just working on that, that shape, that transitions when we lose the ball, who makes recovery runs. I think that's why... 
if you look at, um, say, Hurahan, for example, even when he plays for Aston Villa, and it's the same with, with, with Conley leaving that sort of left wing position. Jack Grealish does it. A Villa at times plays in the left, but goes drifting. Hurahan's energy levels means that he gives cover and a little bit of balance to the team. The problem probably for Ireland is our two fullbacks are looking to get forward at all times. So uh, even even so, this whole midfield thing has a big debate and and what's the best midfield. Even if you go and look at City, who played last year with Silva and De Bruyne in the sort of two number eights position, uh, Kyle Walker, for argument's sake, would come in narrow and give a little bit of cover and balance. And we're sort of don't really want Doherty doing that or Stevens because. When we do play well, our two fullbacks will give us real width and, and, and they're a real threat. So there is a bit of balance to be found around midfield. and um, But we wouldn't have known that unless we, we tried it, unless we, we got through these two matches. So I think I think Stephen will have learned on the staff. I mean, it, it, I, I've seen, I've worked in the pro license with Damien and, and Keith uh, for the last two years. So I think I think they will analyse this match and, and they will, these two matches, and I think they will fix it. And I think it is fixable. I think we've got some good players. Problem for me just at the moment is I'd love a number ten of you know the, the Wes Hulahan type or um, as you said uh, maybe uh, McGoldrick can play there. But when he the problem with say a, a forward playing there is that sometimes you need your number ten to go re, have real energy to give you cover in midfield, maybe make a recovery run, and that's why forwards don't make the best number tens at times. They need you need to be one or the other. So um, hopefully in time, Troy Parrott get game time. He can be the number 10 we're looking for, maybe. Um, so it would be, it, it, it's interesting. I think um, the home midfield needs to give us a bit more balance um, ahead of next month. Yeah. In terms of the role of the backroom staff then, and as you say, you you were with Keith Andrews and Damien Duff uh, on the pro licence and you were Stephen Kenny's assistant, so you're well placed on this. Uh, Shane Duffy said in his press conference that Keith Andrews was talking to him in the dressing room saying he wants to set up a Zoom call with Duffy and Egan over the next few weeks just to look back on some of the clips and to try and work on the shape of the defence and things they can do because they're only again going to have two training sessions before the game against Slovakia. How much freedom does Stephen Kenny give generally to his assistant in terms of working on the training ground and away from the training ground. How involved does he want his assistants to be? Um, I suppose I don't know how, how the internal workings of this setup is, you know, so I don't know. Um, I imagine now um, anything the likes of Keith would do at that video session, I imagine that's run through Stephen. He won't be doing that on his own back. You know, I think they'd be working together. They'd be... Um, There'll be more than just Keith in that session. Damien is very, very good on, on the IT, as is Keith. Uh, Damien is really strong. We've seen that on RTE at different stages. He's re um, the, I spent the week or a couple of days over in Celtic and I've seen the sort of training he's got there. It's, it's exceptional. So he's really strong at that. Um, so, again, it's all about your staff complementing each other. So um, it could be, for example, Damien or Stephen and Damien picking the clips, Keith presenting them. It all depends. I don't know how that's going to work, but uh, the modern-day footballer really wants that information, by and large. Some just want to get on with the game, but um, as much as as much as much Keith and, and Damien and Stephen may be doing video sessions, I think, I think, and you can hear it in, in Duffy's voice there, and you can hear it in, in his explanations, I think it's it's game time he needs. Mm. He just lacked a little bit of sharpness. Uh, again, the, the best example is the goal against Bur Bulgaria, like by and large, when 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 he's at it, he makes that recovery. He's back in around and a little bit of cover, and it's there's, there's no goal conceded. So I think um, I think they've got a they've got a great to go back to your question. Look, they've a great balance in, in their staff. I've seen the three of them really closely. So I think they, I actually think they'll get it right. I think that that part of it will work, and um, the players will obviously. It sounds like from what you're hearing from the players in the interview, you really was respect the backroom staff and um, they respect what's going on and I think that's been, the sound bites are very positive for, for what's been done on the training ground. Yeah, there's one thing that's clear from uh, being in on all the press conferences of the last week, that the message of a different expectation has got through to the players. Every single player has brought up a more expansive style of play, how they're going to do things differently. And by and large, in particular, I was listening to Conor Howard uh, before the game, you know, really positive 
as to how that may benefit him. Obviously, he was dropped 24 hours later, uh, but feels like he's a player who that this style and this system may suit down to the ground. Uh, just on the defensive side of things, I, I want to play a clip of Kenny Cunningham uh, from OTBAM uh, this morning, because obviously Ireland have been so solid at the back that it was the one area we sort of thought that Stephen Kenny didn't need to think about, and maybe he doesn't. Maybe it is all just down to match fitness. But Kenny Cunningham feels that the defence does need a bit of work. I think we can also talk about the defensive solidity of the midfield three, which hasn't been good enough over the past couple of games. It's been far too easy for opposition teams. We yeah. saw Finland in the first half of the game yesterday actually pass through our midfield three and actually get at and expose our defensive four. That's been a little bit uh, too easy. So we need to, we need to get our defensive solidity, solidity better in that midfield area. Those midfield three really have to narrow up and start making better decisions, get more compact and make it more difficult for opposition teams really to isolate our centre-halves and to play those killer balls, which you have been doing in behind our centre-halves and Shane Duffy in particular. So I have no real problem between the relationship between the Shane Duffy and John Egan. It's centre-half and full-back at the moment, right-back has been the problem, but also in terms of that defensive shield in front of the back four hasn't been good enough either. We saw it yesterday, Harry Arthur played a whole mid midfield position yesterday. Unfortunately, Harry's not good enough defensively no. to play that position. Uh, but James McCarthy will come back into that position. But it's about the other two players as well, how those three players function as a unit, our possession uh, of the football, for me, which is going to be key. So although a lot of the talk is going to be in terms of a more expansive game, more possession-based uh, 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 game, that's uh, I, I buy into that. But that's going to take time. We may, we may not see the fruits of that until next year, maybe the World Cup qualifiers. But in terms of getting a real improvement before the game against Slovakia, the work that can be done on the defensive side of the, the game and the days leading up to that can be absolutely key. And that's what's going to be key to beating Slovakia. Not necessarily how well we pass the ball, our possession stats, how well we defend as a as a group. And there's always an, almost an argument for me. It sounds kind of quite Neanderthal to say, but to actually put your best 10 defenders on the pitch against Slovakia. And by that, I don't mean putting 10 centre-halves on the pitch. I'm looking at that, those five midfielders and say, who our possession do you trust to dro drop into it? At times, a deep defensive shape that can actually make good decisions. And that means wingers dropping back in and that midfield three, which five players, that blanket of five players across the bridge can give real protection to that back four, make good decisions in terms of when to squeeze, when to drop cover space, slide across the pitch, give each, give each other a cover, keep that kind of balanced shape to the team out of possession and give ourselves an opportunity to actually break and, and break efficiently on the counter-attack. That's the type of game I think we actually need to see against Slovakia. That's the type of game I think we can play. We're actually quite good at and which can actually win the game against Slovakia. Kenny Cunningham there on this morning's OTB AM, brought to you with thanks to Gillette, made of what matters. Uh, Vinny Perth is with us. All what he's talking about there, does that all make sense to you, Vinny? It does, it does, but um, it, it's sort of re it's rewinding a little bit, to be fair, and I understand the logic of it, but it's rewinding a little bit as in, you know, bringing in hard workers over, over skillful players, and it's a bit like, Conley over over um, James McLean. We we all love what the work rate of James McLean who mm. go up and down and um, and there may be an argument for instead of two expansive wingers, you you, you have to bring James into one side and maybe uh, one expansive winger on the other side away from home. Um, so it, it's about striking that balance. It's about you know, and this is where the argument or the discussion I would say has started is what do we want? Would we rather Lose one nil to Finland last uh, last yesterday in in a in a manner where we keep the ball and we try to do the right things, or would we accept losing one nil um, and and just being the old sort of Ireland way, huffing and puffing? So it, it it is it's a difficult one, it's a difficult one for the manager to get right. But this is a this is a, a game that gives an opportunity to get to it uh, to the Euros. So we we must do what's right. And I think Stephen, as I, as I said in the beginning can be pragmatic. It's not all about all out attack. They will they will watch the game. I watched the first half of um, Slovakia against Israel er, um, in the last while there. Slovakia were winning one nil. So away away to Israel. So it's a difficult tie we have. And Bosnia were beating Poland as well. And um, albeit they were at home. So mm. it's in that tie. Northern Ireland are struggling. But 
So you've, you've two really difficult away ties, no matter who they are, to win just to just to qualify. Um, so it, it is it's a difficult one. I understand where Kenny's coming from, putting and and that's where if Malumbi was to play a couple of games for Brighton, you would say that's great because we get legs into midfield. Um, you know, if Brady was to play for for Burnley, great. You'd imagine imagine Henrik is Hendrick is going to play for for Newcastle. So. I think I think game time for these for our midfielders is crucial. And a and a wingers, it's it's crucial. But Conley doesn't play for Brighton. Do we do we throw him in in four weeks' time? Which is a real possibility. He may not get a lot of game time. So the hand can be forced. And I don't I don't necessarily agree with Kenny uh, um, Kenny Cunningham's uh, ideas. I think we've moved on from that slightly. But at the same time, we have to have the balance right between. A little bit of hard work, a little bit of Irishness about us, but at the same time, we've got to keep the ball, um, keep the ball. And I'd rather, if we do fail, at least we fail in a, in a positive way, if that makes sense. Stephen Kenny said himself over the last week that he feels he's pragmatic. All right, that if he's not wedded to any particular system, and that if he felt a three-five-two may be preferable, that he would go to that. Like one of the questions that's probably going to dominate over the next month is around Matt Doherty and Seamus Coleman. Everyone wanted Matt Doherty to get a chance, but then Matt Doherty can't get forward because probably hasn't established a relationship with Shane Duffy and doesn't feel he can bomb forward because he's going to leave these massive gaps there. How do you think Stephen Kenny responds to that? Like, If we can't get a Matt Doherty in an attacking position, are we not just better off having Seamus Coleman and his, firstly, defensive qualities, but also his leadership qualities in the back four as well? Yeah, but... I mean, the question is, are, are we on a journey or are we not on a journey to something different? Um, I think vast majority, there is people who make the case for Coleman uh, this time last week, but vast majority of people understand that Matt Doherty's attack and play um, is what we need. Um, so I even heard somebody making the case for, Jen, uh, for Glenn Whelan coming back into the squad at 38. Um, so, look... We're on a journey to something new. It may not work over the next couple of months, but we've got to trust that we've we, we've made a change. And we've already seen it. We've seen people keeping the ball. We've seen goalkeepers not looking just, just to kick for the sake of it. We've seen midfielders putting their ball on the foot. And it's not going to... Um, the results aren't going to just going to change overnight with that. It's going to take time. So we have to involve. We have to allow Matt Doherty to become the number one right back, if that's what he is. Um the, you know the argument of three five two is a different argument because it's arguably that a, a good few of our players are suited to three five two, mm. and I didn't expect Stephen to make that change straight away and just come in three five two, etc. Um, but it, you could argue, I mean, when you look at uh, McGoldrick when he came on, at times he was in our own half receiving the ball when we were on the attack. Once he, he dropped into the left full area, and that's what he does as his club. So. Uh, he probably is suited to playing in a in a three five two system. It may suit someone like Aaron Connolly. It would definitely suit both of our fullbacks. Um, so, but but we have to become a team. When I look at w someone like Wales under uh, Coleman a few years ago, it took a long time for Wales to become a team, and he got to it. I think it was the semi final of the European Championships. So you look at Northern Ireland getting to major tournaments, limited. It took time for them to become a team, and um, I, I I think we need to be careful there. We don't just throw out these different scenarios. With, with respect, I suppose, it's a different argument when it comes to two of the better rifles, but one rifle, one right wing back in the Premiership. and So it's a difficult one to answer. But uh, Stephen is backed already. I think against Denmark, the back four was as good as most Premiership back fours. Um, that means Doherty, Egan, um Duffy and Stevens. That's it. That was excellent against against Denmark. I would say uh, in our last real competitive game. So um, we're, we're we're in a difficult situation. It's a pity that we have two class players in the one position. But um, the the balance may be can can we fit both of them into the team? And that's where three point two may work. May work in time. Stephen Kenny obviously may have changed over the last couple of years and may have changed the way he operates uh, around, I guess, the media and how his life in general runs now that he's the senior team manager. And there's been a lot of discussion, and that is the way. Even if it is two games, he may have wanted to treat them as friendlies. Like, it's the great thing about the Irish team. It is the nation's team, and it sparks debate like any other. And 
while I feel, think most people would come along to what you're saying and what Kevin Doyle said earlier, that there's no need to panic. It's the start of a long, long journey. Unfortunately, that has this huge game in a month that is crucial for the future of Irish football in a lot of different ways. But you read something like from Noel King this evening, which I think is somewhat out of tune with what people would feel that, you know, there's going to be a lot of conversation, people voicing their anger, opinions. You know, people might even start already saying that, you know, he, he could lose his job, that maybe he should be removed if things don't go well over the next month in the match against Slovakia and Wales. Is he someone who tunes into all that? Like, is he, is he tuning into the commentary? Is he reading the newspapers? Or is he good at switching off and, and forgetting about that side of things? No, I think, I think he's very focused on the job in hand. And when I haven't spoke to him a lot in the last month um, or last little while, I haven't spoke to him an awful lot. But um, he's very focused on the job in hand. Um, like, comments like that from people is not going to bother Stephen. Stephen, I know. I mean, We've we've often been um, um, criticised to, I mean, you know, different stages. It's part of football now. It's the way the, it's the way the modern game has gone. Five minutes into the game, there was people tweeting, "Oh, this is great, Ireland are keeping the ball against Bulgaria." It changed, and there was five minutes into the game where people were making different comments. So, um, I think the world of social media is is part of life now, and it's part of. Um, I think a couple of years ago, we'd just dismiss it and say, oh, social media doesn't mean anything, but it, it sort of does now. But I think by and large, um, and maybe it's who I'm following, I, I, he doesn't use social media. I, I do when I'm when I'm out of season or when I'm sacked. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've noticed on social media, actually, there's been more people sort of sending a message of we shouldn't be, you, like, it's probably five, six to one, maybe it's who I'm following, but as opposed to, uh, people complaining about where they are. Um, I think by and large, 90, 95, 96 percent of the people accept this is going to take time, and um, we need to be. If, if we're going to go down this route, which we've done, then we need to take our time with it. And um, I don't think Stephen is going to be too worried about uh, what people are saying on Twitter. He won't even see it, so uh, or Instagram or wherever the case may be. He'd stick to, he'd stick to what he knows, and he'd stick to TikTok. His, yeah, he stick to TikTok. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, now he he he'll be focused on it. Uh, I'm not worried about that part. But. Just quickly before we go to a break, Sean and Galway is text into 53106. Lads, the replies from Stephen Kenny are really detailed and thought out. Way better than any previous manager I can remember. Hope he gets time to put his stamp on the team. It, his press conferences are different. Anyone who's covered Dundalk down through the years would know that. And he is thoughtful, almost too thoughtful, almost seems to lose his train of thought at times when he's trying to get that message across, whereas most managers go in, keep it snappy, get a point and move on. Is it something he puts a lot of thought into and will have to put more time into, how he does get that message across in a way that the Irish public wants to hear it? Or again, does he just not care? Again, it's big boy football, so he, he has to be, like, we all have to be careful, especially now in modern media. Um, the interviews are gone. Even in, in in Dundalk, like we'd finish a match at quarter to ten, and there's often been cases at half eleven, twenty to twelve. You are finishing up on your media duties. So I imagine that's tenfold in Ireland. So it is difficult, but he's not someone. I, I and I don't think he should. It's not someone who's going to change because the odd person says, you know, maybe his details are too much or, or different bits and pieces. So I don't think so. I think uh, he's a good relationship with the media. I think. Um, it's one of the areas probably people felt um, he'd be challenged because he, he wouldn't be used to that level of, of scrutiny. But I think he's dealt with it really well this week, by and large. Um, so I don't see him changing up too much um, unless unless the corporates in, in the FEI say, oh, we'd rather you were shorter, but I doubt that will happen. I think um, he's definitely a, a man of the people. He's a, he's a football person. A bit like when Brian Kerr talks, maybe I'm a bit guilty of him myself. He can't shut us up when it comes to football, so I don't see Stephen changing too much. All right, stick with us, Vinny, because we do want to have a little bit of a chat about Dundalk and what happened there, but we're going to take a quick break. Welcome back to the football show. Vinny Perth, the former Dundalk manager, is with us. Vinny, it's the first time we've spoken to you since, as you put it yourself, you were sacked by Dundalk a couple of weeks ago. A lot of people will have read Dan McDonald's article in The Independent about 10 days back where he gave some behind-the-scenes detail of the ever-increasing influence of the chairman, Bill Hulsizer, and Peak Six, the owners, and how things seem to have dramatically changed at Dundalk over the last year. You had, what, less than a year since you won the league? 
less than a dozen league matches and all sorts of crazy things going on behind the scenes in terms of influence and team selections and signings. By the sounds of it, you're better off out of it. Do you feel that way? Um, listen, from a personal point of view, there's no doubt. I feel the weight lifted off my shoulders. Um, it, was, it, it was a difficult um, position to be in at times. Um, people will look at the last couple of weeks, but it was it was a little bit longer than that. I did, to be honest, you know, Dan is someone I usually respect, but I would just dispute a certain amount of things in his article, and that's fine. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming out from the club, and it it, it, it is not as it, it, it is not as what it all seems. Yes, there's some truth in some of the stuff, and some of it's what what bits would you argue with? Well, um, oh, listen, I'd argue with certain parts of like there was. There was not just Dan's article. There was an article that said I'd fallen out with some of the players, like Jamie McGrath. And you know, when Jamie contacts you, say I've seen that article. That's just ridiculous. Like Jamie played his best football in his career under me. So um, that's what happens. People people take don't take responsibility for for what's gone wrong at clubs, and they look to pass the blame. And that's quite often the way. Uh, I take responsibility for for where we are as a as a team now, I take responsibility for where Dundalk ended up after eight games in the season. Um, but listen, the club's been through the muck or through the, the mire, and mm. uh, I have much respect for it. Like in my career, I spent eight and a half years at Dundalk, I'd eight and a half, nine years at, at Longford, or, and maybe 10 years at Cherry Orchard. I'm someone who, when I go to a club, I'm very committed to the club. It's just someone who respects it. So I'm certainly not going to kick, kick anybody or anything in relation to the club while they're down. I, I think it's time that we, we let the dust settle. And, yeah. And I, I, look, I take responsibility for where we're at, but um, the, there's been a lot of stuff said. And in the dark, I know, you don't hear them saying things coming out of the dark dressing room that I know. So um, I'm not dressing room, I'm in the club. So Yeah, well, uh, look, Dan obviously spoke to an awful lot of people there. And listen, in football and in life, people may say things to your face that they might say separately. Your sense is definitely that you hadn't lost the dressing room. No, I, I mean, I'm not saying every player was happy with me, but we 24 players, um, and we signed we signed really well. I still maintain it's the best squad Dundalk ever had mm. uh, in the years I was there. We played 55 games last year. Um, like you rightly said, eight games be pre previously to me leaving the club, um, we, we, we lost a penalty shootout. Um, we weren't good on the day. We lost a penalty shootout. That was to win five domestic trophies out of five. Uh, eight games later, everything is wrong. It just doesn't work that way. It's it's wrong. We, we played eight games in a six-month period because of COVID-19. Yeah. There was players in and out of the team, and I don't expect players at that level to be happy. But the, I, I had a management style even the year before where we'd four centre-halves, and they all played somewhere between... Um, well, Andy Boyle came in late, but the other three all played 27, 32, and 36 games. So the only way you can be successful with 55 games, I mean, the, the night we won the league, uh, we went 15 points clear to win the league against Shamrock Rovers with, with, with four games to go. Uh, that was our, our 16th game in some 49 days. So yeah. big squad. So COVID-19 had a huge part to play in everything in a club and, and the lack of games and no, no league cup was gone and etc. We play every three days. Very easy to keep players yeah. happy. We're we're very tight on time, but just considering the uh, the outside influence that was coming on you, it seemed in the week of your departure. Would you have real concerns about the man that's been put in your place, Filippo Giovagnoli, as to how much control he actually has of that team? No, and again. Uh, uh, I make it quick, but I don't dispute everything Dan has said. Um, I, I, we've great journalists who give League of Ireland a huge, uh, a huge time and a huge piece, and Dan is is one of the leading ones in that. What I'll say about that is sometimes things have to hit rock bottom uh, for it to get better, and sometimes someone has to take a bullet uh, for for things to get better. And I hope that I, what I've done is I've left the club now in a better place, and it gives it a chance for people to go, okay, there was things wrong. And to fix them, we have to make these changes. Uh, I think that might happen. I have a feeling it will. Um, and that's why, as I said, the eight and a half years of the club, 
it was it, it would be an easy for me to do certain things, but I I felt it was important that I stood up for the club. Yeah. And ultimately, myself and the board had a different opinion, and, and we went our separate ways. All right, Vinny, thanks a lot for your time. We'll come back to it again over the coming weeks. Thank you.